Hello, and welcome to the Focusing Way podcast, available on iTunes and Stitcher. I'm your host, David Battistella. Anne Weiser Cornell was getting her PhD in linguistics at the University of Chicago when she met and studied with Eugene Genlin, the originator of focusing, starting in 1972. Learning focusing with him has led to a lifelong process of discovery and personal development. In 1980, Eugene Genlin invited Anne to assist with his focusing workshops. This started her on a path to become a focusing teacher, and in 1990, Anne became the first person to support herself full-time as a focusing teacher. Today, Anne is internationally recognized as one of the leading innovators of focusing. She's taught focusing in 18 countries, and her focusing books and manuals have been translated into seven other languages. Anne is well known in the focusing world for her attention to the language that facilitates focusing, her popular manuals, and her co-creation with Barbara McGavin, of Treasure Maps to the Soul, a body of work applying focusing to difficult areas such as addiction, depression, action blocks, self-criticism, and unfulfilled desire. She's the author of two books on focusing, her bestseller, The Power of Focusing, and The Radical Acceptance of Everything. Anne's newest book on focusing-oriented therapy is Focusing in Clinical Practice, The Essence of Change. Anne is authorized by the Focusing Institute in New York to offer the Institute's certification as Focusing Trainer. And joining me now is Anne Weiser Cornell. Anne, thanks for joining me today. Happy to be here, David. Um, I just wanted to begin... um, sort of at the beginning of focusing because you were really right there. And I was wondering if you could describe uh, from your perspective in Chicago with Jean Genlin, those early days of focusing as you experienced it. Well, I must say that focusing does go back earlier than my involvement. And yet uh, I could say those were early days. I met Jean Genlin in 1972, and it's because he was already teaching focusing in a community church in Chicago, because his psychology grad students had asked him to teach them skills that they would need to operate a hotline, a help hotline, like a suicide line, but also people looking for a listening ear, somebody to help by being there for them with an emotional uh, level of empathy. So his grad students wanted to respond to the political issues of the day, the early 70s, Mm -hmm. by creating something that would help with the social situation there in Chicago. And they asked him to give them training for that outside the university setting, not in a course, but in a setting where it would be open to anyone who wanted to attend. And I think that probably comes from Gene Genlin himself, that he's always had a philosophy that these skills should be available to anybody. They belong to everybody, and anybody can be a listener and a focuser, and these skills ought to, they belong and ought to be free to everybody. And so I, that had already been going on mm-hmm. for a year or more when I heard about it. And I was a linguistics grad student, so I, didn't, I wasn't interested in psychology at that time, and I wasn't drawn to it as a psychology student. My friends were telling me this interesting thing is going on in this church on Sunday nights. Let's go see what it is. I was drawn to my own emotional healing and growth. I was beginning to understand that by 
going inside and doing some kind of inner work, my life could get better. Mm-hmm. And that's what drew me there. And there was Jen Lin on mm. Sunday nights teaching focusing. And a community that had risen around him of maybe 100 people who were exchanging the focusing and listening skills. And to, to me, it was a revelation because it was the first time I'd ever met people who were trying to be authentic, trying to speak genuinely from how they really were and how they really felt and trying to hear the, the, the real and the authentic in each other. That had never happened to me before. Mm. Could you maybe set the stage of that? Like you've already sort of touched on it, but entering into that environment for you and those first experiences, could you go into that a little bit? So I walk into the room. I've got some friends with me, so it's not too scary. But there's 80, 100 people crowded into a room that really was probably meant for more like 60 people. There's Jean Genlin sitting at one end of the room on a table. I thought, wow, that's unusual. Sitting in a, not like an authority figure or a teacher, but just like one of us in a very relaxed way and saying things like this is changes changes was the name of the hotline and also the name of the group that grew up originally to train people to be on the hotline but what happened was and this happened before I got there people enjoyed the community so much that happened out of the training evenings and the, and the exchanging of the skills that only some of it was about answering the hotline. Most of it was about who we were, who the community was and, and what, what kind of atmosphere and mutuality was created. And again, about the setting, early seventies, there was a lot of student unrest. The, The Vietnam war was still going on. There, the student uh, protest movement and its and the response by the United States government had started to turn violent. Recently, there had been two what we call massacres. That is, <laughs> some protesters were shot and killed at Kent State and Jackson State universities. And so there was a feeling among student groups in the world in our, in our country, uh, this is a this is a serious time. Mm-hmm. This is a dis, this is a time of disruption. This is a time of mistrust of of authority, and it became, you know, everybody had their own response to that. What this group was trying to do was respond through creating a community of mutual support. And I, so I walked in and I was in that atmosphere. They welcomed me. They welcomed everybody. Welcoming people was part of the spirit of it. Mm. There was never any question. In fact, the first thing Jean said was, if you're here, you belong here. Mm. That so sensitive to the fact that what, you know, what groups often do is draw a line and exclude outsiders. And in his belief and the belief of the people who learned from him was, we want a group that doesn't have outsiders and insiders. If you've cared to show up, you belong here. Mm. So I did feel welcome from the very start. And I also felt odd because I had I was not a psychology student, and although I was interested in personal healing, I'd never done any. The closest I'd come was reading a few books Mm -hmm. and recognizing that things in my personal life were out of control or in trouble because of uh, things inside me. Mm -hmm. And knowing I needed something, but then being here in this room full of people, 
I could tell many of whom knew what they were doing or knew why they were there, and I didn't. Mm. I, I just was curious. And then the teaching from Jenlin wasn't one-to-one -one teaching. It was he, he was taking the whole group through exercises. And he would say things like, go to the place in you where you have feelings. Mm -hmm. I remember that sentence very well because I remember having a hard time with it and looking around the room to see whether other people knew what he meant. And they looked like they did. And so in that way, I felt quite odd. I don't know what he means when he says, go to the place in you when, where you have feelings. I, I wasn't... I didn't recognize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that whole experience would sort of set you on this amazing path. And I mean, it's just so um, interesting to hear about those early moments. And just the other interesting fact that that group, that changes group continues today, I think. Well, that name changes is still used for that kind of focusing group where people where it's free and people meet to exchange skills. And by the way, we had an expression back in the 60s and 70s. I'm going through changes. And right. that's where the name came from. Yeah, I'm going through changes. <laughs> and, and to have this kind of space um, inside uh, this room where outside of that room so much was happening, um, especially for young, intelligent, concerned yeah. people. Um, but the difference of those two spaces, as you describe them, is um, sort of so uh, already there, our inner space and our external space, one where we sort of reach for that sort of quiet um, and the other one outside, which can sometimes be very like our quote-unquote yeah. regular world which can be sort of tumultuous yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 but i wanted to go on to three sort of very important words that sort of emerged out of that uh mm. which are the felt sense and mm -hmm. the felt sense is a term that beginning focusers might not completely wrap their head around or even maybe don't even need to understand right at the beginning but what I'm curious about is how would how would you best describe the felt sense? Well, it's interesting, David, as you as you remind me of my own journey and my own history. I have to say, I did not understand the term felt sense for a long time, and so in a way, that's kind of reassuring. <laughs> if 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 people are encountering focusing and they can't quite get their head around the term felt sense, it will still work for them. Mm -hmm. I actually wrote my first book, Power of Focusing, I would say now, not really understanding the felt sense, what the term felt sense refers to. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would say now is that felt senses are rather rare. They're not just any body sensation that has an emotional meaning. The felt sense is only those body sensations that have come freshly, that come in the immediate moment when we invite them or when we turn toward our inner experience with a kind of expectant curiosity. And then when something kind of forms freshly, like the feel of the whole thing, mm -hmm. that's a felt sense. So I might have been, you know, let's say something... Uh, difficult happen to me. And then I go around all day with a kind of bad feeling about it, mm -hmm. like a heaviness in my chest and kind of a, Ugh, that didn't feel so good. That would not be a felt sense. It's more like that's the impact of what happened that my body is carrying. But it's not what Jenlin means by a felt sense. Then I pause and turn toward that feeling and toward the incident that it refers to, and allow a kind of fresh sense of all that mm. to form. And that's the felt sense. Sort of the moment that you are present to that inner experience. 
And there's something in that moment that happens. He uses the word forming, and I think that's very important. In other words, there's process going on. When I don't just, I'm not just bearing or carrying what happened to me, but I'm actually a bit proactive. I'm turning and inviting or asking for the whole feel of it. And what what Jenlin actually says, and I remember uh, how astonishing it was when I learned this. He says it most clearly in his book, A Process Model, is that it's when the felt sense forms that we're actually already moving beyond the problem. Mm. And I thought, oh my gosh. I had always thought that the felt sense is the feel of the problem. You stay with it, and at some point it, and, and at some point it shifts, and then you're beyond the problem. And Jenlin says very clearly, no, it's the felt sense, the forming of the felt sense itself, that's your organism already moving beyond the problem, even though you may not, probably don't, know yet what's different. Mm-hmm. The forming of the felt sense is out there in advance of all the other things that are going to happen when your concepts catch up with it, mm-hmm. your actions chat, catch up with it, your relations catch up with it. The felt, forming of the felt sense is the first step and a genuine step into a new world. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I know. So, so just the very act of turning toward is is already creating um, or if, or bef- before you've maybe even had the felt sense, but just the act of turning toward an acknowledgement is when the organism really begins to move in that direction or change direction. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The act of turning toward, the act of pausing to turn toward our own felt experience and our circumstance or our situation is the key, really. It's when it all begins. From there, there are many steps afterward, but they're all contained or implied by the first turning toward. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you come into this whole situation with the mm. formal training of a linguist. That's true. And, and out of that, you help develop an extension of focusing, I'll call it, um, and a whole new kind of focusing called inner relationship focusing, which I'm Mm -hmm. trained in, but which is a bit different from focusing the way it's described by Jen Lin in, in the original book. And, and what I really love about focusing is that this, there's a way and there's a lot of room to grow and develop And there seems to be room for different styles. And is that because of how focusing was developed? Is it because of the initial openness that you are able to take your particular gifts, talents, and skills and apply them to a a whole new kind of focusing that's come, that's been known as the inner relationship focusing? Well, definitely it's clear to me that Gene Genlin his his profound commitment, not just to lip service, but in every cell of his body, he believes in, how should I say this? He believes in inclusion, every person finding their own way. And it would, it would be anathema to him to ever tell someone how they should teach focusing or do focusing. He, on the other hand, he does have certain things he would say, like this isn't focusing, this is focusing. So, so it's, uh, it's not like he says anything you do is focusing, but his, in his philosophy is the, it is, it is clear in, in the philosophy that he's developed, because he's a philosopher, that any given idea can be expressed in innumerable ways. There's no limit 
to the number of ways in which any particular idea can be expressed. You can, and that's because the idea, for example, is, is, is present implicitly, and something that's implicit can be brought into being explicit in limitless ways. Mm -hmm. So in a way, if you think of the focusing process itself as being something we have implicitly, any of us can bring it into expression. For example, teaching it, writing about it, telling about it in our own way. And, and, every, and, and, and then in the next day in a new way, and in the next day in a new way. And all of them can be true to what it is. Mm. And I just wanted to, if I may, say a little about what, what led to inner relationship focusing being developed. It's probably partly right that my linguistics background had something to do with it. When I met Barbara McGavin in 1989, and I knew her by correspondence even before then, she had already also been working with some of the ideas that formed inner relationship focusing, and she is not a linguist. So inner relationship focusing is, an, is a kind of a t attention to the way in which we pay attention to our inner world. It's not different from what Jen Lin was doing before, but it's a slightly different emphasis. Mm -hmm. And then in 1994, so about five years later, when Barbara and I were both facing big personal, big tough personal issues, and we needed to develop out of the focusing we were doing something that would actually help us address those big personal issues. That's when I would say we started to uh, invent a, part, a kind of parts work, working with parts mm -hmm. out, of, out of necessity. And again, Jenlin, it's not that Jenlin didn't. Do, had any, didn't have any parts work at all. It's that it wasn't emphasized. Mm -hmm. And what we learned, and but I think Jenlin agrees with this completely, but our statement would be, you cannot even get a felt sense if you are identified with a part of you instead of this identified. And so, so the emphasis on the importance of disidentification, not not being identified with a part of ourselves and how key that is for focusing itself, but especially for applying focusing to life issues and problems that have been persistent and intractable, not responsive to the, to the attempts to change them. That was, that was when inner relationship focusing really got its impetus. So what I would say now about inner relationship focusing is that it is a combination of felt sensing and working with parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so beautiful how you describe the openness of what Gene is creating because it's sort of the expression of a human being, like the fullest possible expression of every possibility of being human in a way and and it's almost as though through his philosophy and through focusing he's he's trying to find that thing that will allow us to do that which creates this beautiful sort of also non-judgmental part um of focusing that is that is such an integral part of of how we we do focus so in focusing we speak about parts, which is short for partial selves. Um, mm -hmm. So can you speak a little more about how you've come to understand what happens when we come into relationship with these parts within ourselves and how you explain parts to others? Hmm. Barbara McGavin and I uh, were, you could say, forced by circumstance to deal with some of our most challenging life issues as it turned out, around the same time. Mine, uh, addiction to alcohol, hers, uh, 
suicidal depression, and other various blocks and limitations on our life. And it, we, we learned through working with those issues that it would work best to speak about parts of us. I, I liked what happened when I said, a part of me would like to drink until I'm drunk. And not, I would like to drink until I'm drunk. When I could say a part of me would like to, then that would be the beginning of a curiosity and a relationship with that part. Hmm. And it would open up into, I'd like, to, I'd like to find out from it what it's trying to help me with by doing that, what it's afraid of if I don't do that. And I could also turn toward its antagonist inside me, the one that feels terribly ashamed of having, of, of having those desires or taking those actions, and I could get to know it as well. And so based on what worked to release and shift our challenging life issues, we began to use parts language. Mm-hmm. And we can say part of me or, so, and, or something in me and so on. Then later we began to try to think about what do we mean? What are these things that we're calling parts? And we, it became clear to us, again, it worked better if we don't try to entitize them. We don't try to name them. Uh, we don't try to assume that we have fixed parts that will always be there whenever we bring awareness to ourselves. But instead, we, we use a kind of language that has a temporariness in it. For instance, rather than saying there is an inner critic, we learned that we like better what happened when we say there's something in me that's criticizing right now. Mm-hmm. So naming naming by the behavior or naming by the process that's happening rather than saying there's an entity that has this name, the inner critic. And what we named when we called what was happening by, uh, in, in process terms, it was clear that it was much easier for it to change. The next minute it might, that might be something that's not criticizing anymore, but that's, but that's sad and mournful or that's anxious and letting us know what it's anxious about. So learning kind of in a practical way that we, and, and again, you can hear my linguistics coming into play. Mm-hmm. We, we don't want to use nouns. We don't want to use, give names to these felt experiences. And if you look at other methods of parts work, there is a bit of a tendency to name the parts mm-hmm. and, to, and to assume that the same parts will appear again and again, like the pusher or the inner child yeah. or the inner critic and so on. And those methods often come to the conclusion that parts never really disappear, that they'll always be around and that they're teaching us to make accommodation or, or shift the kinds of communication styles the parts are using. But when Barbara and I used language that was based on process rather than on entities, we saw a much more fluid situation in the inner world Mm. where things would change. We would not expect to find the same situation again and again. Now, having said that, we also did often find the same parts again and again. So the way we began to understand that is that life, organismic process or the movement of life itself naturally flows. It flows forward from implicit to explicit, from desire to action, from intention to carrying out. And yet that process of forward flow can get stopped Mm -hmm. and severe stoppage of that is often what we call trauma when something the organism needs to be fully alive or to be fully developmentally able to take its next stages is just not available well 
often that doesn't kill us, but we move forward limited. Mm -hmm. And those we began to understand that those that the parts are arising in the places or in response to the circumstances of some kind of stoppage, some kind of not allowing or something not possible or something needed not being supplied. And then parts arise to try to to try to resolve those stoppages or to try to get some of what was needed, even when all of what was needed isn't possible. So we began to call a part a repetitive reaction state. That it, mm. there's, a, there's a continuing situation, which is some kind of stoppage. And because the situation is continuing, evidently the reaction to it is also continuing. It looks like something that's an entity, but it's more like a wave continuing to hit a rock. Mm. It's, it seems to be something uh, that continues over time. But when the obstacle is removed, when the, when the rock is removed, or when the issue of the stoppage is resolved, then there's no more part. Mm. And, you know, in other methods, you'll, you'll hear people talk about the part needs a new job, or it's, it doesn't want to die. If, if, if this gets resolved, it's afraid I won't need it anymore. We don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. We, we see, we don't see parts wanting themselves to survive because they haven't been entitized. Mm -hmm. What we mm -hmm. see instead is if you do see something from a part's point of view, you can see that it's just trying to help the whole person. And, and remarkably, and this is something that makes me very happy, I'm not the first person who, who has observed this, but it makes me very happy that in all the years I've been working with people with very challenging issues like addictions and depression and so on, um, I've never found an enemy inside. Of, uh, there are no enemies. Mm. In every, every part of us, even those that seem the most self-destructive, the most harsh, they all turn out to be trying to save the person's life in a situation where there's some severe stoppage or limitation. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that brings me a lot of joy. You've been listening to part one of our conversation with Inner Relationship Focusing Teacher Anne Weiser Cornell. Please tune in for our next episode when we continue our conversation. You've been listening to the Focusing Way podcast, available on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. Also check out our website at thefocusingway.com.